All right. Any questions on either type of hypertension? All right, we're going to go 180 degrees. We were just talking about how to lower high blood pressure. Now we're going to talk about how to raise low blood pressure. And that's what a vasopressor does. Uh, <coughs> it raises blood pressure. All right, now, uh, <coughs> we don't like to use vasopressors because they all, well, when you get a, a hypotensive animal, we do kind of a, a, a three-step approach. We've got fluids, we've got inotropes, mostly do, uh, dobutamine, and then we've got vasopressors, uh, which are vasoconstrictors in actuality. So if they're hypovolemic, we'll volume load them. We want to make sure they have plenty of fluid so that they can vaso, um, uh, vasoregulate and raise their blood pressures. The blood pressure is not from uh, hypovolemia. Uh, especially in anesthesia or ICU, we'll add dobutamine to try to raise the blood pressure by increasing cardiac output. All right. Only when neither of those work do we go to vasoconstrictors. And it, it's fairly obvious or intuitive that the reason is we don't really want to vasoconstrict flow to the tissues, okay? If we vasoconstrict to raise arterial blood pressure, that's at the expense of blood flow into a tissue by vasoconstriction. <clears throat> so it's only when other things have changed and we've got to get the blood pressure up or we're not going to perfuse the kidney well enough, we're not going to perfuse the brain well enough that we go to the vasopressors. And they're all vasoconstrictors. Most of them as alpha agonists. One exception I'll give you. Now, epinephrine uh, can be used for a lot of things. It is a vasopressor. That's kind of an overall category. And we use epinephrine in cardiac arrest, <coughs> in uh, asthma, acute bronchoconstriction, and in anaphylactic shock. Okay. And the route of administration is determined by which of those three you're treating. Okay. Cardiac arrest is the only time you give it IV. And if you don't have a catheter in, we can give it intratracheally at a higher dose. What we'll do, uh, normally in ICU when a dog arrests, they have a catheter in and that's no problem. If one comes in off the street, hit by a car and arrests and we don't have a catheter while we're getting a catheter in, you can give it by, um, uh, by the trachea. So there we'll draw up, it's a much higher, about a tenfold higher dose of epinephrine and we'll dilute it with about 10 cc's of water or saline and squirt it down the endotracheal tube and then bag them and they'll absorb enough that way. But mostly we're talking about IV administration here. One of the things that we don't do anymore is we don't give intracardiac injections of epinephrine unless we are visualizing the ventricle. That's because you're too likely to hit a coronary artery and then they'll, they'll um, get a uh, cardiac tamponade. So no more injections into the heart unless you're doing open heart massage and you can see the ventricle. All right, now what we're doing, we're doing two things. One, in an asystole, which is the most common form of arrest, you've got asystoles and you've got V-fibs. Those are your two main types of cardiac arrest. In asystole, we're trying to stimulate the muscle to fire, ideally the SA node to fire, all right? And it is a strong beta-1 agonist, so hopefully we do that, all right? But we're also wanting to vasoconstrict. When th they go into arrest, they lose all sympathetic tone. <clears throat> so their blood vessels just open wide uh, and blood just pools. Uh, even if they had a heartbeat, they would still not be pumping blood because of the severe vasodilation, all right? <clears throat> so that's, that's two reasons that we give it. And we start with what we call low-dose epinephrine uh, and then we go to, uh, if it's uh, ineffective, we go to high-dose epinephrine, which is 10 times low-dose. And again, you don't have to know this. Just what I have here is what you need to know. But uh, we go to high-dose uh, because 
epinephrine becomes less effective when the animal's acidotic. And the longer they are in a rest, the more acidotic they become. So we're having to increase the dose of epinephrine to, to combat that. A logical question that ought to come to your mind then is why don't we just use high dose epinephrine to start with? And the reason is epinephrine is also very arrhythmogenic. So you can uh, jump them from an asystole into a V-fib uh, by using high dose. So we, we start with low dose and then we uh, only use the high dose when they're non-responsive. Okay. <coughs> that um, risk of V-fib of causing arrhythmias is why we don't go IV in any of the other indications. When you get a true anaphylaxis, <coughs> uh, we give epinephrine IM. And uh, we avoid the arrhythmias. And also in humans, when they've done this, there's a risk of hypertension. They'll take the blood pressure too high. By going IM, we minimize that risk. And remember, epinephrine stimulates beta-1, beta-2s, and alphas, all three. Well, in the muscle, you mostly got beta-2s, which are vasodilatory. So when you give it in the muscle, those beta-2s are going to vasodilate, and you're going to get pretty rapid absorption. All right. So uh, we uh, give it. It'll last about 15 or 20 minutes off a single dose. So you're not done with it when you have an anaphylaxis. You're still getting in an IV catheter and starting fluids and antihistamines and all these other things. But the epinephrine is what is going to keep the animal from dying uh, while you're doing all that. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, and uh, one of my, my, I wouldn't say it's a pet peeve, but it, it's just one of those things that doesn't make any sense, is when veterinarians reach for steroids for anaphylaxis. Steroids take hours to work. It, wasn't, it doesn't hurt if you give it, but it doesn't really help. Main thing is anaphylaxis. Antihistamines are the other thing that you can add. Uh, we'll talk about those in the anti-inflammatory uh, lecture coming up. And then you're addressing sustaining their blood pressure after that. Now, you can have an allergic reaction where they bronchoconstrict without being hypotensive. In other words, you can uh, use these in asthmatic attacks. And that is done in human medicine. There, we would give it sub-Q because in the sub-Q tissue, which adrenergic receptor predominates is the alpha receptor. So <coughs> uh, there, you, you get slower absorption at the sub-Q site, so you're, you're again less prone toward the um, arrhythmias and uh, overdoing and hypertension. Having said that, mostly we're going to use beta-2 uh, agonists instead of epinephrine. In human medicine, they'll give epinephrine an emergency asthma. We almost never use it for this in, in veterinary medicine. So largely, it's anaphylaxis and cardiac arrest. Now, back last semester when I talked about the autonomic nervous system drugs, I made a point that you don't give epinephrine if they have an alpha blocker on board. This is called um, <coughs> epinephrine reversal. Okay, and to, to review, uh, again, epinephrine stimulates all three adrenergic receptors, alpha-1, beta-1, beta-2. Okay, now, beta-1 is the heart. Let's take that out of the equation for right now. We're just looking at what happens to that blood vessels. Alpha-1s vasoconstrict, beta-2s vasodilate. But if you look at the body as a whole, there are a lot more vessels that have alpha receptors than there are vessels that have beta-2 receptors. So the net effect <coughs> is one of being a vasopressor, of raising blood pressure. If you block the alpha receptor, though, with ACE promazine or these other drugs, then the beta-2 vasodilation is unopposed. And instead of raising blood pressure, uh, epinephrine will actually cause a lowering of blood pressure if they've got an alpha blocker on board. So we always uh, avoid epinephrine uh, when there's an alpha uh, blocker. Uh, that has been reported to occur naturally uh, without epinephrine in stallions, for example. 
they'll take a very high strung stallion and give him, uh, it could be any horse, uh, and give him ace and he gets real excited and then he collapses. And the idea, the thought behind that is he's, uh, again, we're blocking his alphas with ace promazine and he's got an endogenous epinephrine surge that causes vas vasodilation and hypotension and collapse. So that's uh, epinephrine. Uh, so we really don't use epinephrine for vasopressin except for anaphylaxis, okay? So what do we use? We've got several different choices and it tends to be clinician preference. Uh, the criticalists like norepinephrine, it stimulates alpha-1 and beta-1 but only modest activity on beta-2s, okay? I the only uh, I haven't seen norepi used here in a long time now. Dr. Timms came on board a year or so ago, uh, and I think she's a little bit more of a proponent of norepi. We used to use vasopressin, and the nice thing about vasopressin is it doesn't work at an alpha receptor. It's the one vasopressor that is not an alpha agonist. It works at a vasopressin receptor. Okay, duh, yeah. All right, so, uh, and so in addition to it being antidiuretic hormone, it raises blood pressure. And we used to use this a lot in ICU until there became one vendor of vasopressin. And guess what the, the cost did? It went from like $20 a vial to $700 a vial. All right, so we don't even stock it anymore. I looked this morning, we don't even keep vasopressin around anymore. It was very, very uh, popular at one time. <coughs> I skipped one. I should have had, I apologize if I don't have dopamine in there. Dopamine is probably what we uh, would go to. I, I know I covered it earlier, but I should have put it in there. I'll, I'll try to go back and do so. Again, remember dopamine has a therapeutic window and we get the beta-1 stimulation and the dopamine receptor stimulation uh, at the heart and at the renal arteries respectively and that's our main use in, in, is dopamine for oliguric renal failure, trying to convert them to a polyuric renal failure. But if you take the dose higher, you do vasoconstrict, you start stimulating alpha receptors. So uh, this is, uh, I think Dr. Seitz really likes dopamine infusions as his vasopressor of choice. And the good thing is it's such a short half-life you can titrate it to effect. Uh, it's not just a, a standard dose. You start and then you just adjust it to effect. And meanwhile you're trying to address why they're hypotensive to start with. <clears throat> so uh, dopamine definitely needs to be in there. Alright, I guess that was my last slide on vasopressors. Anything on, on those? <clears throat> 